Okay, this video is somewhat of a rationale for the solution that was um, scripted and, as we would say, developed. Uh, I titled it How Dr. John Penn Solved the Young versus Old Earth Controversy. And of course, uh, this is uh, his hermeneutics, uh, historical, holistic hermeneutic approach. Uh, this is just a handbook for practitioners. Now it's in PDF format. Uh, you can get this at uh, Lamp Theological Institute. Go to baptistlamp.org and you can download this. Of course, uh, the hard copy is nice. This was a original proof uh, copy and it's really nice to have as far as uh, video. And, uh, but he noticed first that either or, the either young or old so we know this is very common in a lot of the controversies and perceived contradictions in the scriptures. So one of the first things um, he always recommends, and he describes his hermeneutic as holistic. Of course, it's historical. That's his words, his descriptions. Uh, and it was interesting because uh, we'll talk about some of that. But define your terms, that's point number four in his uh, book. And of course, we all know that that's really where a lot of the confusion originates like what does someone mean when they say young and what does someone mean when they say old so he said take a holistic approach so holistic of course uh, in uh, selective perception is the tendency to see the world the way we would like it to be rather than how it really is the sound thinker suspends judgment and is not unduly influenced by stereotypes prejudices isolated experiences or preconceived notions. Now, it doesn't mean we aren't influenced by that, just we're not unduly influenced. And Dr. Penn talks about in his hermeneutic uh, from interviews and those of us that attended the Missionary Baptist Seminary and studied under him. And I served as a graduate assistant for a period of time when I had returned to seminary. So if you were careful to take notes, uh, he helped me learn to first assume I was wrong, know that I'm carrying pre-understanding into the text, which is called uh, eisegesis, and then the error of omission, we can leave out parts. And this quote about sound reasoning is from the little blue reasoning book, and this is something I just recently received, 50 Powerful Principles for Clear and Effective Thinking. And then it also has another quote that is similar to his holistic approach, take a holistic approach, called all-rounded thinking. Thinking that encompasses both sides of an issue or topic is probably the greatest asset that training in critical thinking can lend us. And of course, Dr. Penn always emphasized that the Bible contains no contradictions, so what are we doing here? Now, first thing we'll do is set aside what he helped me understand was uh, Bullinger was a famous writer uh, of language and years and years ago, he had noticed between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, it was his blunder, actually, Bullinger's blunder, and why that was understood that way, and I'd never understood that, but all that uh, Dr. Bullinger had done, I think it's E.W. Bullinger, if you wanna read about that, it's in his book, How to Enjoy the Bible, and what he had said was when uh, geologists finally determine how old the rocks are that they were studying, there's plenty of room between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2 for that to be settled. So he moved on. Apparently, he didn't consider that a controversy. Well, it wasn't a controversy in Dr. Bullinger's day. And for him, he just dismissed it by saying, I have a place to place that. Well, that's not really critical thinking. It's not really a study of time. Uh, time can only be communicated in a ratio. For example, for us, lifespan divided by death or decay rate, how fast do we decay? And those are the things that uh, Dr. Penn presented and I functioned as his research assistant working with uh, Dr. Eddie Johnson, a colleague, and we had been working with IamCorne.org and when we began uh, collaborating and giving feedback, uh, I was letting Dr. Johnson know research assistant under guided research by Dr. John Penn. He's retired hermeneutics professor uh, approximately 37 to 40 years, somewhere like that at the Missionary Baptist Seminary. So uh, with a lot of time on his hands and a lot of accrued uh, 
information, multi-degree professional, subject matter expert in several different fields. He was able to pull all this together. So uh, I'll just demonstrate a little bit of what he did. Uh, he talks about uh, mental models. I'd asked him, told him I'd done some work in uh, where Gnostics were now taking uh, their own mental constructs and were abandoning the script. So he talked about a scripted model. Let's take what the Bible says, gather all the information, and then we put that together. Can we come up with something? Well, uh, let's, let's do that first. Let me see if I can just put some information up here. So we know it's an either or. So I've got some little cards here. And we'll just take the data that we have. A book of Revelation, chapter 11, speaks of 1260 days, 42 months, 42 months, that's three and a half years, and that's out of 360 days, 360 days. There we go. So as this developed, we said, okay, the, the year is uh, 360 days. Okay, so that was done. Then he cited Second Peter 3, 8 and Psalm 90. A thousand years is a day, and one day is a thousand years. So that was, as he explained, that's a ratio. Remember, time can't be communicated except in ratio. So the Bible is very much a source of all the fields of science, physics, calculus, and chemistry. The theologian uh, Isaac uh, Newton and Leibniz, I don't remember his name, but Leibniz, they both invented calculus at approximately the same time and living in two different parts of the world. And mathematicians invented calculus, developed it. They were theologians, so to them it was a, a work of theology. So Psalm 90, Moses wrote Psalm 90. Uh, you can also find 360 days in the Old Testament as well. John 11, 9, Jesus said 12 hours in a day. So we have 12 hours day, day, and the word in the Old Testament for time is the same word translated day. So that word, I think it's yom. It's translated day, and it's also the word translated time. So we now have 12 hours in the day. That's also true in the Old Testament where it says in Exodus 29 and 11, it compares the six days that a man works and rest on the Sabbath, it correlates that with the six days of creation and the seventh day. So we have 12 hours as well. 12 hours. And the Bible speaks of day and night. And of course, we speak of daytime and nighttime. There's two there, nighttime. So we have this idea of these words being used, even as they both come from the same word in the Bible. So that's some of the numbers, some of the things we began to work with. Uh, more of the uh, substantial information was uh, the idea of why and how did people live so long in the Old Testament, and yet they were still functioning, such as Noah began building the ark while he was in his 500s. Well, John Sanford, who was a professor at Cornell University, again, as a research assistant, you go find all this stuff, but a Cornell University professor for more than 30 years, PhD from University of Wisconsin, published over 100 scientific publications, and he started a nonprofit organization called Feed My Sheep Foundation. His book was entitled Genetic Entropy, and he made some outstanding observations. In his book, however, he cited a 2001 work by Holliday and Watt, and he says, he said their papers compare the lifespan of early biblical characters to how long they were born after the patriarch Noah. 
the biblical data recorded thousands of years ago clearly reveals an exponential decay curve. This unexpected pattern in the biblical data is amazing, he said. They said, we are forced to conclude that the authors of the books of Genesis, Exodus, Joshua, and other books either faithfully recorded an exponential decay of human lifespans, or they collaborated, <laughs> which over that long period of time, it was not possible. They collaborated in fabricating the data using sophisticated mathematical modeling. But they pointed out to fabricate this data would have required an advanced knowledge of mathematics as well as a strong desire to show exponential decay. So these observers of the decay after the flood and how man began to decline away from the thousand year day span in which uh, Adam lived 930 years, Methuselah 969, but no one lived outside the thousand years. This is where uh, strong evidence now uh, from a genetic uh, prof a professor of the study of genetics Genetic Entropy, his book is an outstanding book. Uh, you really should read that, especially when you see how much it uh, demonstrates the credibility of the Bible. Uh, first of all, uh, it goes on and uh, a quote here, genetic degeneration accelerates as the rate of time increases. Now that decay rate is what's interesting because at one time in Psalm 90, God removed 90% of the lifespan of 100% of the people. So you take Genesis 6, you take um, Psalm 90, and you can see where God's Spirit would not endure uh, more than 120 years. And some have said, well, that wasn't lifespan, but that was talking about how long he endured before he destroyed, destroyed the earth. And yet we see people approaching 120 years uh, and not outside of that. So we have 80 years in Psalm 90, 120 and 6, Genesis 6. So we're looking at a thousand years lifespan in which man once lived and functioned, which means the decay rate was much slower. We all know that because how did a 500 year old Noah function like a 50 year old man would today? And that's in the Bible and that's been observed by students and professors and scholars of that research and that quote of a mathematical model. So we have a 1,000 year lifespan reduced to a 100 year lifespan. So when Adam fell, he was reduced from never dying to a thousand years. Then sin was so abounded, read the first three chapters of Romans, which refers to that uh, antediluvian uh, what was going on on the earth that, that triggered the need for the flood in the first place. And then notice today we have a hundred year lifespan, but to reduce crime, God removed 90% of the lifespan, which was reduced, which was actually a finite span of time, 1,000 years that had been imposed on Adam, who had, when created, was without an end. There was no end for him to experience. So we move from no end to a thousand years and then that's reduced. And some have even uh, asked about uh, how could God shorten a lifespan of a, one of his own children today in this world as corrective action. And I've said, well, you didn't read the scriptures where he removed 90% of the life expectancy of 100% of people. So if you think uh, time's moving quickly, it might not be time moving quickly, but the decay rate is definitely uh, modified. So if we look at this and we see a time is volume, this is where we had, of course, there were people saying the earth was anywhere from 6,000 to 20,000 years, 20,000 years. So working offline, working and doing the homework and then going back to see uh, Dr. Ken, uh, the difference here is 14,000, 14,000, and then as, and I've worked in a process control, so it was like when you become a process control specialist, you start evaluating the data, and you don't want to add things, and you don't want to subtract things, you just want to evaluate the data, and then collaborating with the uh, uh, fellow colleague from the Missionary Baptist Seminary, Dr. Eddie Johnson, 
who was the Missionary Baptist student of the year. I was there when he was uh, acknowledged, and I appreciate it. And we had studied in language together and studied in hermeneutics with Dr. John Penn, language, Bible languages with Dr. Randy Murray, and systematic theology, Dr. John Owen. So we were well equipped. We had the tools. So when Dr. Penn expected um, collaboration, it wasn't, it was an honor that he expected the work. So if I just started with the 7,000, I said, well, the, just take that in half. So how do we get there? So for 7,000, I split the difference. And then I started with 6,000 and went 250 was my first number. But remembering that there's 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night, and that's volume is Dr. Penn. Now he's, he's a multi-degree scholar. He studied several fields. I even have, uh, I've seen his textbooks, a physics textbook, a math text. So he, he had this rattling around in his brain, but he was pulling it together. He's taking a holistic approach, an all-rounded view, taking the challenge that there is no contradiction, refusing to accept the false dichotomy of either it's a young earth or an old earth, and insisting that the terms be defined. So here we go. So if this is true, and I go 6,250, but let's just double that for a moment. So we say, well, what if this time volume here? So let's just go to 12,250. Well, 12,500, I mean. And by that meaning take 6,250 plus 6,250. Again, just using all the numbers in the Bible, and that's all that happened. So that led to just drop the operators in, and what would this look like is that, and then what would this look like? So back over here, though, if you're defining your terms, what do you mean by young? What do you mean by young? Well, if that means recent and old refers to decay then if you've ever gone to Answers in Genesis a website produced and sponsored by uh, I believe Ken Ham is the founder of that uh, you can read articles where they talk about let's put the young or old that's that either or idea, either either young or old. Well, there's even an article where they put thousands or billions. Now, rewriting this either or doesn't really bring us to the synthesis that we would prefer. So that's definitely not a criticism. It's just you'll hear a lot of people say thousands or billions. Well, recent thousands, billions still doesn't ask what are we talking about? Or what are we talking about? The billions of what? Well, that's the, that's the opportunity we had that if we eliminate the either or, which is not critical thinking, it's just pick a side and some who really aren't interested in the subject, just pick one side and then ridicule or negate the other. So that's not really what researchers do. It's not what people who've invested their lives at times. So if you take this 12,500 times 360 days, that gave, well, let's do this. So you multiply that, and that equals this right here. So that you have one day, this ratio, one day to a thousand. So that's where you get to 4.5. Well, let me just draw an arrow. You get 4.5 million days. Days. Now, if you then take that those days and multiply it by a thousand years, that's real easy. Just change a unit measure from days to years and then change a million, which is six zeros, just add three more, and that's where you get uh, 4.5 billion years. But what are we measuring? And for example, when Bullinger Professor Bullinger, the language scholar of uh, over a century ago, was saying, well, just whatever time they find, those who are evaluating the rocks, just place it between 1-1 one, one and 1-2. One, 
that really didn't show much interest in time and the decay rates. It didn't acknowledge the curse in the fall where Adam had received a finite amount of time within 1,000 years. And then in Psalm uh, 90 where we learned that God's judgment was based on the need to remove 90% of the lifespan of 100% of the peoples. And that's really what's fascinating because how do you account for genealogical records if we have gaps that are larger than the entirety of the existence of the universe so and the earth itself? So this is now why it's important to define your terms and why could we have more decay than the lifespan. For example, if lifespan yeah, lifespan divided by decay rate, and that equals. So how could someone live a thousand years and look like a hundred year old man when they die? And how could a hundred year old man when he dies look like a thousand year old man of the Old Testament? Well, it's because we have decay rate uh, accelerates exponentially as you can read in genetic entropy by the professor at Cornell University. He noticed it. He mentioned uh, and cited a work from 2001, a Holiday and what, W-A-T-T, -T, 2001 work he cited, where they noticed exponential decay rates and a decline in the exponential curve. So they observed this statistically, they observed it arithmetically, they observed it mathematically, and this answers everything. And now if you want to know then how much decay took place and how much, what are we measuring in the universe? Because everything out there, for those who acknowledge the amount of cosmic debris, billions of tons that fall through our atmosphere, and that everything out there, galaxies are colliding, and those of us who support the Bible know there's no life out there. And Hubble went out the telescope and went out and proved that and demonstrated there's no life out here. There's uh, two thirds of matter is dark matter, energy, dark energy. Things are die dead out there, colliding. Things are burning out. Uh, things are flying through the air. We think they're shooting stars. They're just m meteor fragments of celestial bodies. All that out there. So look at all that death. And so much is unknown about that that the phrase anti-gravity didn't exist until after 1996 because there were celestial bodies flying, hurling through space that according to our reasoning should continue to accelerate the further they were moved from the object that had, had uh, caused gravitational pull. Well, as it distance from the object of gravity is increasing, it was assumed by our science and our own thinking rationale that, well, it would continue to accelerate. Well, Hubble noticed that, no, it's slowing down. So there's things out there that are reducing, decelerating, and they'll eventually will stop. And then some are supposing it'll all contract and return. Now that would be a good study to think about how all this will come back together for what we know the new earth to be when it's all reconstituted. Now that's just things for people who enjoy thinking, studying the Bible, and demonstrating that the Bible has a knowledge uh, and a rationale for how something could recently be created and yet have a decay rate more severe than the lifespan afforded it. So that means we can decay a thousand years worth of death in a 100 year lifespan. And that's exactly what takes place. And that's in the Bible. And that phenomenon is called a judgment and a curse of sin. So how Dr. Penn solved it was the way he approached it. And the way he approached it was take the information we have so let's go back this direction which you know this is this is easy now that we have all the numbers and we can just now this is just a demonstration of their correlation i wouldn't know how to prove any of this except in the mathematical model of exponential decay rates and the fact that the bible teaches that a lifespan can be affected let's say you have a decay rate uh, 10 uh, to the 10th power which is what we have. We are, we are decaying 10 times faster than people in the uh, Old Testament. So before the flood, you live a thousand years, let's say, or within that, and after it, a hundred years. So that's what, this decay rate's what God has sovereign control and in judgment, he 
withdrew and accelerated that decay rate by 10 times, which is interesting because uh, it's prompted uh, some research now into where did that ratio of that 10 times more. So that'll be discussed. But if you come this way and you go to a thousand years to one day, then you just let's come back this direction and change this. And what this will do is a uh, thousand days, if you change that to days instead of years, that's approximately 2.78, yeah, 2.78, 2.78 years to give you a multiplier. And 2.78 times 4.5 will give you the 12 point, an approximate 12.5 billion years. And yet, it's regrettable because when people hear you say something so many years old, they're so we're so primed in the either or dichotomy and so emotionally charged rather than cognitively engaged that we forget that when we say something's old, we assume it had to have been created 4.5 billion or 12.5 billion years ago for that much decay, but that would be to omit the reality of decay rates before the flood and after the flood. So students of the flood and that narrative, uh, several people took more interest in it when the young versus old. So good did come out of this, even though a lot of people pointed their fingers. That's not really the people that do the research. And in this case, uh, that's not really what we're talking about. So this decay rate's really the key to understanding this. When you notice in the Bible, for example, a fig tree can be withered and, and decayed instantaneously, the Bible said, water can instantaneously come to be uh, wine, and then think about someone being resurrected from the dead, instantaneously regenerated, so that's the decay rate inverted, and think of how people could be healed because God's sovereign control over time. He could do the same therapeutic process, but he could do it and by compressing the time. So instantaneity in creation is definitely uh, Credible, it's taught, it's demonstrable, and we can understand the decay rates. And then back to the gap, as people call it, we have knowledge of how did this universe, what was this hyperinflation rate as it's described? What's this that seemed to catapult matter, the word earth matter, this material? What hurled it out there? Well, if you go and do a little bit of use of these numbers, you'll find that even that. If that occurred at 1,000 years per day, you're looking at a, a rate of, of time passing, or, well, we can't impose it referential time of Genesis 1:14 outside of time. So referential time before verse 14 of Genesis 1:14 doesn't exist. Referential time was created for us to live, to farm, to rise and sleep and it was for functionality on the earth as creatures created here and placed here on the earth. But if you were to impose that referential concept between 1-1 one, one and 1-2, one, you're still already looking at, well, you're looking at a hyperinflation rate that's approximately 36 times the speed of light. So that type of decay and whatever was there, as people describe it, in that judgment that was triggered that people talk about, and again, most people can't talk. We don't, aren't able to collaborate because we want to avoid anything that might not support our either or dichotomy. We don't really want to define our terms and we don't really want to take a well round and that's okay. I certainly have no problem with someone who wants to uh, retain one of these identities. It's just, I would really like to know what they mean because if you're talking about a recent earth creation event, and then you're trying to give a rationale for the amount of decay, we have that in the thousand year to a hundred year decay. And that all is hinged as well on the flood narrative and the reality of the implications of what took place before the flood and after flood. So uh, this way you can do, you can go to um, iamcornet.org books tab. There's books here, First Adam and the Planet Earth, The Bible Doctrine of Time. There's the Bible Doctrine of Time, Difficult Problems in Creation uh, Solved and there are um, the holistic hermeneutic approach, historical holistic. Oh my, we just have several things there. So enjoy reading, enjoy studying it. I recommend Genetic Entropy by John Sanford. I also recommend you um, 
uh, consult that book and then inside it has references to other studies to see those who evaluate this statistically and arithmetically and mathematically. So you have a blessed day, but this is how the younger old earth controversy was solved for Dr. John Penn, hermeneutics professor, missionary Baptist seminary, retired and still going strong and working. So that's how he did it. Here's the rationale if you ever wanted a defense of it. And no, it didn't happen this quickly. It took research and he labored and toiled and uh, was giving out a lot of assignments. So you have a blessed day.